Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scullion, a.k.a. Scully. Owen Mallon, a.k.a. The Bear. Aiden, the face for radio behind the scenes. And today we are joined with Neve Brownie. Hiya. Neve. How are you? Welcome to the on. show. Thank you. You've brought a book with you anyway. I have. Your own book. Prime position. I yeah. know. Didn't think that would have been happening. Uh -huh. Here we are. But we'll get into that later on and how the book come about. Maybe before we just get going, Neve, on the more serious note, some of the things we're going to discuss today, um, we we well, we well, use a bit of humour and we're having a laugh and we're having a laugh out there before we come in, but there's a very serious topic on eating disorders, mental health here. So if anybody's triggered from this, we're going to include a lot of links to the uh, charities here based in Northern Ireland and ones for our field. So if you're feeling in any way triggered by this podcast, please reach out and have, have a word with someone, talk to somebody. And while you're there, click subscribe. That was a shameless plug, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it? At the end there, click subscribe. So subtle. <laughs> but Neve, thank you very much for coming down. Thank you. Did you Thanks have a long journey? Um, from Lisburn, came oh. today, so no, not too bad. A day off work, so oh, you couldn't anger me. That's it. That's it. Sticks of Kirkstown to the big technical centre. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm not used to those wee windy roads. To be fair, coming up, God love the about ten cars behind me because I was going about ten miles an hour. <laughs> It'll be all right. Don't worry about them. <laughs> That's the way I drive too, so I wouldn't worry about them. Neve, uh, you know what? Let's just jump right into it and uh, we're going to find out who you are, where you grew up, what is the crack and, and who is Neve. Sure. Um, so my name's Neve Brownlee. I'm from Carried Off. Um, Mum and Dad are still there. My brother and my nephew and all now. Um, I went to school in Belfast and then uh, about a year and a half ago, me and my boyfriend got a house in Lisburn. It's been there all going well. Um. I was a primary school teacher originally, um, so I did my, we went to university for four years, um, St Mary's in Belfast, um, but I'm in civil service now, admin. So instead of, of looking after children, you're looking after children in the big hell? <laughs> 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 haven't had too much to do with them now, <laughs> not yet, haven't let me, let me up there. Uh, they're um, not there, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's true, it's empty anyway. Um, but yeah, no, all, all going well so far, and then yeah, as of... Um, November 22, so almost a year ago now, I also became an author, which I never thought that was not in the plan. <laughs> but um, yeah, I released this book now um, for publishers, came out of Belfast, took it on. And it's the diary I kept then when I was um, really unwell a few years ago. I was in a hospital, in a psychiatric hospital, a couple of hospitals. Um, and yeah, all the money's going to a couple of charities. So... Do you want to, let's, let's do the, the, these aren't shameless plugs because these are welcome plugs. It's not like me self-promoting there. But uh, do, who is the charities that benefit from the book? Yeah, so they're, they're on the back of the book there. But, um, and they did wee forwards for the book as well, you know, yeah. talking a wee bit about what their services. So one of the charities is Aware and I. So yeah. they're a depression charity in Northern Ireland. Um, and then the other charity is the Eating Disorders Association for Northern Ireland as well. And so, the book is named Struggle to Breathe. Struggling to breathe, yeah. yeah. The diary of a psychiatric inpatient. Nice wee short and snappy, isn't that's it? it. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's going to give us a bit of insight in, in what's yeah. coming up. And yeah. uh, one thing, I've, uh, you have a very glowing, warm personality. You're very bubbly chatting out there. We're having the crack and, <laughs> and uh, we're talking about upcoming trips. <laughs> but, the less said, the better. <laughs> um, Neve, it wasn't always like that, but it wasn't always like that. Um if you want to take us back till when this all started, till when when you're aware of it all starting, yeah, till unfold and how it presented itself. Yeah, sure. Um, well, a lot of this now I'm only really aware in the last couple of years that I've gone back and tried to understand how this all happened. Um, so now I can see that um, from I was a very very young age, way back to primary school, I have really strong memories of just developing this hatred of my body um feeling like physically there was something really seriously wrong with me um and comparing myself to all the other boys and girls in the class and even stuff like you know we went swimming with primary school so I was maybe p4 p5 and being so stressed you know the whole week before the swimming um getting a sick feeling in, in my tummy like kids would maybe do when they're when they're nervous or they're worried about something because I was dreading having to be in a swimming costume in front of the other kids in the class and um 
you know, there was one week that we were swimming and I spent the whole time breathing in and sucking in my stomach. Now, there was no stomach there. It was like skin and bones, but to the point where I developed this rash all over my body. I actually still get it sometimes, like a stress rash. And, you know, the, the instructor's coming over and saying, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with her. I kind of knew this is what happened to me when I get stressed. But yeah, um, I, I can see and I can I know now that right back to, you know, that really, really young age, I just started to think there was something wrong with me. Um, obviously didn't tell anybody. I probably didn't really have the words even to know that this was different or not everybody felt this way or, or thought this way. Um, and I think because of that, I started to push myself kind of beyond what was healthy into school work and into kind of academics. And I kind of thought, right, if I can get A's and the GCSEs or then A's and A levels, you know, this will be something that I could do really well in. And maybe if I'm like are seen as maybe like a smart person in school or you know I'm involved in all these clubs and I'm, I'm in the choirs and I'm, I'm everybody's friend and making a big effort so that everybody would like me maybe other people will kind of forget about the fact that what I thought physically there's something awful about me like I I did believe if I was walking down the street that strangers would you know, nearly run away from me in, in horror, you know, um, and it all pointed at me and people were whispering about me because I, I just believed that I was, I looked like, like a monster. Um, by the time I got to my A-levels, so about 17, I think I was turning 18, I, well, for a few years up to that, I had started kind of dabbling in restricting food, um, going on diets without really kind of calling it diets but you know I would cut out certain food groups and um, I would do a lot of exercise I would be over exercising you know really pushing myself when my body you know was was exhausted and um, I would try to you know I would be able to make myself lose weight very very quickly um, you know by not eating for a certain period of time and then there was one day um I think I was off on study leave for my A-levels and I had at something that wasn't part of the plan. Do you know, I was trying to lose weight and I hadn't really been eating much and I ate one thing that, and I just went into panic mode and I thought, okay, how much sort of exercise do I have to do to undo that or how, how many days do I have to go without eating? And for some reason, it didn't feel like enough at that stage. So, unfortunately, and I don't want to go into too much detail, I don't want to upset anybody, but that was that was kind of what pushed me into the start of, of um, developing bulimia. And from that one day, that, that kind of became the pattern for about 10 years, for about, 10, for about a decade of really struggling with, with the bulimia. So I struggled to eat I struggled to eat a meal without um having to purge in some way sometimes it was a physical purge sometimes it was purging through exercise um but that was kind of everything had stepped up a gear um and yeah, as I said for the next 10 years it was a real battle a battle that nobody knew about for a long time um and with that or kind of at the same time it's hard to say which one came first or but I'd started to develop a depression as well that I know it was now. Again, at the time, I, I didn't really, I just sort of thought maybe everybody feels like this or everybody thinks this way about themselves. Um, that had also just been going on in the background and, and I'd started to really kind of isolate myself and just hated everything about myself. And there was nothing that, that I could say that I, I liked about myself. And, but still I kind of went into university and um, eventually my mum had kind of came to me. I think it was about 21 or something at this stage. And I had said, you know, at that point I was kind of going to university, going to my classes, going to the lecture, coming home doing all the work that I had to do, you know, dissertations and all the exams and all that kind of thing. And that was kind of it. Everything else had stopped. I'd stopped 
doing anything that I enjoyed. I'd stopped meeting people, stopped kind of going out with my friends. I would the very bare minimum so that nobody would ask questions. And also I wasn't easy to live with. So I was living at home that year and, you know, I, I kind of changed from this person that was like a happy person and, and nice to be around and fun to be around and, you know, excited and enthusiastic about things to just living in, in my room. And um, eventually my mum came to me and said, like, there's something really, really wrong here. And I think I better head off as I kind of had been doing. Like she, she took a lot of shit at that time as well. Um, she got a lot of the brunt of that. But um, at that stage, I, I knew that that something had been really bad and really wrong for four or five years. And it just came out that day. I told her, um, I'm, I'm miserable. I hate myself. I, I want to hurt myself. I've kind of plans to hurt myself. I'm, I'm being sick every day, you know, multiple times. It all just kind of came spilling out. And she took me to the GP within a week or so. Um, and that was when I got diagnosed with depression and um, with an eating disorder, bulimia. Well, it just sounded like an awful, an absolute prison of, of, of hell that you were living in. Did were you aware that you were you had believe me? Were you aware that this or or when it first started, did it seem like it was normal, or or did it become to the point where you're like, you know, obviously you just you bottomed out there and and and, and it just come out of you. But when you were saying there that you remember that day, and and obviously now with self reflection and stuff, you've learned you you started going back further and seeing where it it, it developed, but. Were you aware that that this was a problem, and at the very start, and I, and I don't, and, and I know that sounds like a really stupid way to ask you because, I mean, when the first day when you're like I need to do something, did that seem logical to you at that point? Because I'm just worried that people are, are at the early parts of that now, and and you'd be justifying it in your own mind that that, that this was okay, that this totally. behavior was okay. Do you know what? And that's the scary thing to see. Whenever that happened, I thought I had like cracked the code. I thought this is it like I have been for as long since childhood as long as I as I have can remember can think back I have wanted a way to control my body and to try and make myself as small as possible and and initially I thought oh my goodness this is fantastic why have I never thought about this before why has nobody ever told me this is such an easy an easy way to try to to achieve that that goal that I've been been doing I've been working towards for so long which is terrifying because so quickly it became the only way that I could cope every single day it was the only thing that I could do that I started to feel safe in you know and, and anytime I became overwhelmed I thought well this is something I'm really good at this is something that I will never fail at um it became like my only coping mechanism and to me, it was like it was like an addiction. You know, after a while, I started to recognize that this isn't good for me. This is, I could be doing a lot of damage here. At that stage, it had got such a strong grip in me that when, when I got to the point of saying, okay, maybe I should stop trying to do this, I couldn't. It was too deeply ingrained in me at that stage that if I, when I wanted to try and step away from it, try and put a wee distance between me and, and that behaviour, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, it, it it just escalated so quickly that it was became the only thing that then I knew. It was like my norm, you know, to, to do that over and over and over again. But you were going through all that by yourself and you said that nobody, nobody knew you. No way. Like you were keeping that to yourself and you said that they were your feelings like they were that was how you were feeling but it's like anything i said to you, you you get this wee thought and you have it in the echo chamber and it starts bouncing around and the more it bounces around the more you start saying it is it is true same way as you were saying about you're thinking that's what other people are thinking of you but it's it's not it's not the case at all and you kept that to yourself Maybe if you had a, I know, I, I can't talk about it because I don't, I've never been in your shoes, but 
you're saying you spoke to your mum about it at that stage, but if you had to maybe opened up to a friend or whatever else, and they had to maybe give you the reassurance and going, look, you are thinking that way, yeah. but they're not real thought. They're not true thoughts. They're not true thoughts. Totally. The things that you're thinking about, even just to talk to a friend, a family member, what I'm trying to get at is if somebody is going through that and they're trying to keep that all to themselves, knowing what you know now, do you think it would be beneficial for them to speak to your friend or a family member or somebody just to get them thoughts out? 100%. That's what I've learned now. And look, don't get me wrong. Now I'm in recovery from the eating disorder. When we talk about the depression, thankfully, I, I happily say I'm recovered from that depression. I still have to keep a really close eye on my mood. You know, now I can see that I have that vulnerability or that tendency. But I, I'm confident that I'm recovered from the depression. The eating disorder from where I where it was like and what I describe in the book for where I am now it's like night and day I'm at a place with it now that I never thought I could get to after 10 years you know of living with it constantly um but now don't get me wrong I still am having to battle against those thoughts all the time and that is the, the number one thing that I've learned over the years as soon as I get a thought in my head of like so this morning before I came here I was recording a wee talk for, um, it's like an event that's on with, with um psychiatrist. And whenever I was sitting down to do that, this thought that I had in my head was, as soon as I pop up on that screen, they're all going to think, what a disgusting person, what a repulsive person. And that's just kind of, my head is used to that from 10 years of telling myself it. And back in the day, that would have triggered me into either starving myself or binging and purging now I have to have that conversation with myself but I also have to have that conversation with with other people now the couple of people I have around me and say I have this thought going round and round in my head sometimes it's enough me catching it and having that conversation with myself like no that's not fair that's that eating disorder voice popping up and trying to make you feel bad other times I do need to have that conversation with somebody else like my boyfriend or my friend or my mum and say, I can't get this out of my head. Like, I'm like a broken record in here. Um, my biggest regret from that time when I was 17, 18 is not telling somebody. Like, if I could go back there and and just say to my mum or say to a teacher that that's what, what I had was doing. Because I did, I know, I, I did know it was wrong. Like, deep, deep down, I knew that I shouldn't have been doing that. But I just think of the next 10 years of my life, I feel like so much time was wasted. Like there was so mu- so many things that I didn't do and I couldn't do because of the eating disorder and because it controlled every single area of my life. Like there, there, was, there wasn't one area that wasn't tainted by this eating disorder. Anything I went to do, you know, and, and even going out with my friends or going on holiday there were so many things that I turned down and said no I can't do it because I was so worried about how I would look how my body would look what we were going to eat was I be eating in front of everybody I just feel like so much time was wasted because I didn't ask for help I didn't tell anyone what was going on but I suppose now I just have to I can see now what 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 can happen if you keep that to yourself and I can't let that happen again but seventeen is a very young time for people. You, you have the maturity and and hindsight. Uh, hindsight can beat us up, you know. And I, and I think and I hear that in you that you're you know I wish I. That's that, that it's it's something we can say, but a seventeen year old going through that the emotions and you know, and it's not it's not a it's not something that the, we can sit back and say oh you should uh, we yeah. we hope. But it's hard, and and especially with with an eating disorder, you will you, you will find that it, there's the secrets and lies that goes with any yeah. sort of disorder or any sort of condition. Very much when you were saying speaking there about an eating disorder, and I, I, me and Sean actually were having that conversation. Is it right? Am I right in saying it's, it's similar to like alcoholism in the way that you you're you're never fully you you're always recovering. Am I right? Is, is that a, is that a, a for, or is that you don't fully recover? You, you, you identify and you, you're always is that, is that a is that a fair assessment because I'm not I, I, I always yeah. do a way to say the wrong thing but no no of course um 
there are people who have had eating disorders and are in full recovery, have fully recovered from an eating disorder. And and they're, thank goodness, you know, and and they will come out and tell their stories. I've met so many people that have had, maybe had a diagnosis of bulimia or anorexia, binge eating disorder was one of the other eating disorders. There's there's actually so many, you know, um, different kind of subgroups and subcategories off those kind of main ones. I know there's people that can fully recover from an eating disorder. That's brilliant. Because, I know because then it gives you that 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 it, you you you're you're obviously you're working and you're well aware of it now. But you were saying that you, you had that today, so you, yeah. you know that you're you're working to, towards that and you're identifying that. I'm going to ask you something here, Neve, and and just as you brought that up, wh- what's the difference in bulimia and anorexia and and be, because. I, I have an idea, but I just, yeah. I, I don't know. And, and that's why I'm asking you, what is the difference in, in, in them conditions? Well, I'm not an expert, you know. I can only tell you my understanding, which is from no kind of like medical background. It's only the work that I've done over the years. Um, I think anorexia is usually if, if a person is is underweight yeah. um, for like a long period of time, bulimia most of the time is if someone is um, purging, um, you know, binging yeah. and purging after yeah. after the eat. Um, there's also binge eating disorder, which is um, overeating, you know, but maybe without the, the purging behaviours. But there's other, um, th- there are, those three are the only kind of three eating disorders that would be like classified, yeah. you know, but there's other eating disorders, like there's a new one, not a new one, um, like there's one that's kind of, uh, been people have been more aware of at the minute. I think it's orthorexia, and it's kind of like an obsession with clean eating, you know. Um, but and and those those labels sometimes can be really important for people. It can be important for them, and it can be important to make sure that they get the right help that they need. For me, whenever I'm talking about the the eating disorder, I usually call it that the eating disorder because. The way that my eating disorder has presented at times, it hasn't fallen into one of those categories. You know, you couldn't say it's meeting every criteria of anorexia or, or it's meeting every criteria of bulimia. Or sometimes it's been in that grey area, somewhere in between. You know, um, and it's changed and it's developed over over the years. You know, it hasn't it, it hasn't stayed the same. So, um, I think for a lot of people, kind of when when you're talking about their eating disorder that would just kind of encompass that idea that they're struggling with food or they're struggling with their body or their self-esteem and within that it can look different for different people um that probably wasn't the best answer no, but I actually, it's, no, I, it's I, only I, kind of I, as much I, as i know really I, I think that makes more sense to say sometimes pigeonholing something when you don't feel that that all applies to you is really hard for some people, because, you know, and from my understanding, anorexia is the condition that you're in at that point. But there is eating disorders that lead to anorexia. But the reason I was asking that, because, you know, we I get this stereotypical view. If somebody said an eating disorder, I get a stereotypical view of what I think, that you know, what someone's going to be or what way they're yep. going to be and how they're going to behave. And... I don't know how I found it that media, um, maybe a couple of shows. So it was important for me to sort of disconnect from that and ask you. And that's why I want to just like I'm asking you the difference. And, and then people, some people be like, is he fucking stupid? Where I, I don't mean like I have an idea, but I wanted to, while we're speaking to you to, to so some people that maybe don't feel like they don't fit into any of them, but they're having a relationship issue with food. Or their body dysmorphia, where they're they're not they're you know, I often think this, and this is stupid. Maybe if you could, and the world is like this. If you could let somebody see through your eyes for one minute, it would cure so many problems. You know that the the anxiety that people have and the, and the thing if if they could see themselves through someone else's eyes uh, as opposed to, but mm. is body dysmorphia a, a hand in hand with with eating disorder? I think for a lot of people it is, yeah. It certainly was for me. Um, it wasn't something that I was aware of. It was only whenever I went into the eating disorder treatment then um, that I had 
Well, I'd been in and out of the services for for maybe six or seven years, um, but uh, about three years ago was when I kind of, I uh, basically I had presented then at that stage um, as as under underweight. Um, I had was just kind of going through a period of of not eating really and and kind of over exercising and um, at that stage they said, okay, you know we can see that. Um, we need to try and get a handle on this. It's been a long time, and thankfully, at that stage, I got almost a year of of treatment. Um, and within that, I started to put a name to what I was thinking, and part of that was body dysmorphia. Um, I there's actually a chapter in the book that's called called that that I kind of put the the name to after because it was really just. A stage in the hospital that I remember that I'd wrote about I was staring at myself or trying to stare at myself in the mirror um and I couldn't do it so instead I was writing and trying to describe the picture that I had of myself and it was there's there's kind of no other way to say other than it was this monster that I was writing about you know I was writing about and as soon as I thought about an image of myself in my head, it was like it would blow up into this terrifying image of myself. And because that was what I had been telling myself for so long that I looked like, I just assumed that that's what everybody saw, you know, and, and that's why I couldn't look at myself in the mirror, or even if I was out and about, like I couldn't look if we were walking past a car walking past a shop window I couldn't look because I was so terrified of of seeing that image that I had um and we did a lot of work on that then in, in treatment and um that was kind of how I understood that that image I had is false and it's been made up of the thoughts and the way that I think about myself and the things that I've been telling myself about for a long time but it's hard even now it's hard because a tiny part of my brain still goes, you're right. Do you know, it's uh, that image that I've had in my head has been there for 10 years. It's hard to just completely blow that out of proportion. Like if you if you have something that you believe 100% so strongly for 10 years, it is going to take work for me to totally undo that, you know, and start to rewire that. Um, But yes, I think body dysmorphia is something that a lot of people with eating disorders or even with you don't have have to have an eating disorder you know to be to be struggling with that it, it just sounds so complex to me like it as Owen said there can't be pigeonholed into one thing um the it, even talking about it i'm like how wh- what where was the trigger uh, in my head i'm not saying that that is the case with everybody or anybody but i'm like is there something that happened was it like straight away whenever i was thinking about this podcast i was like social media has to be social media but that's not the case at all it not for me no not for you anyway no and as i'm listening to your story as well it same thing it's not only females it's also males as well Definitely. and i know a lot of people maybe thinking as, as female male young old like it does affect so many different people yeah 100 percent. no i mean whenever I was, I'm 30 now this year, so um, when my disorder developed, social media wasn't really a thing. Like, I think I maybe had a Facebook or something back in the day, but um, no, and I'm actually kind of glad of that right now. I don't think it, it would have helped things. Um, for me, I think it's, it's. I, I think I say to my mum sometimes, I feel like I just came out of the room, like a very anxious kind of child. Um there's whenever you kind of look at people with who've been diagnosed with with eating disorders there's usually a couple of kind of characteristics that you can kind of bet on or or at play um one of them is perfectionism very maybe kind of very sensitive kind of people very high achievers very hard on themselves and i mean if if i kind of get the whole list i would tick every single box you know um so I think it was, for me, it was a combination of the type of person that I was. But a lot of, I think also a lot of it was kind of the environment that I was in at that time. So, and that so many people 
would have been in you know and especially like probably people the same age as me like when I was growing up there was so much discussion and talk around diets and you know my family members and my mom you know we've had this all these conversations you know she was a product of what she knew and what she was being brought up with as well but you know my mom and my aunties and the friends were always in and out of the Weight Watchers and the Slimming Worlds and there was always like the the slimming food you know in the fridge and we had the magazines and we were watching the shows on TV and super size versus super skinny it for me it just felt like constant conversation around diets and food and then from I was very young I was aware well I thought I knew that there was such a thing as bad foods and good foods and you were being bad if you ate these kinds of things you were being good if you ate these kinds of things and I started to make the links between the type of person that I was was related to my weight and the way that my body looked so I started to believe that the only way I would be a good person or that people would like me or want to be around me was if I looked a certain way and and my you know my weight was below a certain number and I kind of had these numbers in my head that I believed I had to always be striving towards um so part of it I think was that though those kind of those kind of thoughts that I started to take as facts, you know, about how a person should look and commenting on people's weights on TV and, and on the street. And I just took all of that very personally. Um, also, you know, something that I talk about then in the book, because I was I was trying to work backwards when I was in the hospital to kind of go where has all this come from? Because I didn't know what that stage I hadn't kind of had any therapy or anything that I have now to understand where it's maybe some of it has been triggered from but um you know I talk about that there was a, a period where my mum and dad had separated for a while now they're together now and they're brilliant they're the best couple you'd ever know um and at that stage I remember there was I think I was only about seven or eight when my dad left for a while and moved out and at that stage Obviously, as a child, I knew that there was something wrong, but from my point of view, nobody was talking about it. You know, I knew that, you know, dad wasn't there anymore and mum was really sad and the families were all upset and cross and, but nobody ever spoke about it to me and to me or, or my brother. And, you know, sometimes I would walk in on family member crying or being really upset but nobody ever spoke about it. It was like this kind of elephant in the room. Everybody knew there was something wrong, but nobody wanted to address it. And so I think from that, I kind of started also developing these rules in my head that, okay, if you feel sad about something or if something feels wrong, you don't talk about it. You know, you don't tell anybody. That that was kind of what I started to learn at that stage. Um, even if we all know that something's wrong, we know that we're all sad we keep it inside us and we pretend that we're okay, even if we're not. So I think it was kind of a combination. All of that was kind of like a perfect storm kind of came together. The type of my personality with some of those kind of wee events and also some comments, you know, that were made with the best of intentions, you know, about you know, things that we would all say like when I was a child, things like, Oh, she loves her food or, you know, um, oh, she's she's not a picky eater. She'd eat you if you weren't careful. You know those kind of wee sayings that we have, unbeknownst to the people that were delivering them. You know, friends or family. I had already started to develop this kind of obsession with my body and with food, and I took those wee comments, passing comments, as evidence that what I was doing to myself was right, and that that's what I needed to keep doing then. So. Eve sounds like you were so hard on yourself you lost out in such a lot of your childhood and them adolescent years and you need because you were just beating yourself up it sounds like you hold yourself to such a high regard whether it was academic whether how it was and i would say that's the same for for most people and you're saying that it was sean said to me earlier about this that, that this affects a lot of men as well and I don't know 
why or I'm just stupid that I was like, I had to take a second and I was like, you're right. But we're in a society now where it is so social media driven, it is so image driven. Even the platforms now are pictures instead of videos. You know, people aren't talking, they're posting these absolutely ridiculously edited and over the top things and it, it, it's got to be creating a more of a, a problem than it's helping because it's a fake it's 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 a fake world we're in we know it we know the things we're seeing and, and being promoted and and like it's it's these and and these models and unachievable things they're doing and and the, even some of the ones the pictures are posting they're, they're most at their unhealthiest that some of them but it's bound to be put more of a strain, more people are becoming conscious of that. And and when I hear you saying things, I hear things and traits that I've done, maybe commenting or, or saying something. And like even my young boy, we all and I be like, loves the grub, that one, you know. And it, I worry then, should I watch what I say or was it, should people watch what they say or do you think that you were already, your mind was already in that position that, it wouldn't have mattered really what they were saying. You were just taking it that that was it. And and when you're when you're in a bad place, things like that just reaffirm. Like it's not something with intent, or it's not something that anyone thought. And if they if they ever thought that they said that, they would be absolutely horrified that they had any way to contribute to. But why did I think just assume that? Oh, you must have been bullied, or somebody must have said something that. And I'm I'm sure that is a massive trigger. For a lot of people that yep. have eating disorders, they were bullied and comments were made and children are cruel. and that, That's my biggest fear because at that point when you're a child and you're developing and children develop with such a different variety and especially through secondary school, some girls have developed and some boys have developed and got big and their voice is broken and you haven't and, and at all at different stages and you, you're, you're, the measuring stick is so varied on... There's, there's a guy that's six foot in, in second year and there's a guy that's three foot. You know, the, the measuring stick in school is so varied and where we think we should fit in or, or how we think we should fit in to that. It, 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 society to me seems like it's going so much that road and, and there, there'll be so many more people with the same. But it got, it got progressively worse for you, didn't it? That after your mum had talked to you, and you'd received mm-hmm. your diagnosis. And a lot and, and I want to ask you this here just before we go into where it worse. Some people run away from a diagnosis because they don't want the label of something. Some people say that it was the very best thing that helped them because it then identified that it's not me. I have a condition. It's not it's not my own head. I have a condition. And it's allowing me a point to work away from to, to help myself. Where some people won't want to admit to anyone and they're hiding and they're telling lies and they're, they're doing this to try and hide it from people because they don't want the, the actual diagnosis they don't want the label of it there's like a stigma that's attached to this and you, you can never outrun it but for you there was there was there was a pattern there was up and down wasn't it from when you got when you first received your diagnosis what what was the initial help that you received then when you, when you were diagnosed with bulimia um I think at that stage, well, at that stage, um, I know I was I, I started medication kind of for the depression. Um, I think I was given like maybe six sessions of CBT or something from the, the GP. And then eventually um, I did go down to the, the eating disorder services referral came up. Um, but. It sounds so little. Doesn't it? Yeah. Um that, that first time I presented to the eating disorder services, um I I I was in a I they put me in a room and I kinda clicked through a DVD for for a while, for a couple of weeks. Um there wasn't a massive amount of input at that stage. Um it was and I was kind of in and out there, but there there was never really anything, um, any kind of anything significant. Um, so that was when I was about twenty one. Um, the time that I did get a lot of really good help from there, I was about twenty seven. So it was about six years um, that I I 
nothing really had had made any kind of a difference or I hadn't really had much much of an input. Um would they contact you? Would they reach out to you after a period of time if they haven't heard from you? Um, no, so it was like I was kind of on their books then when that referral came up and I went down and I, I had a meeting with, with a lady. Um it was just kind of like a like an information session. Um there were a few things that were said that weren't great to me at that stage, which kind of put me off the service at that stage as well. Um, but after that kind of conversation with her, whatever was decided, I I then would go down there every week for maybe six weeks. But it was like a DVD kind of that you would just go into your room and you would kind of click through um, kind of like information. I think it was like information on bulimia. Sounds very impersonal. Oh. Yeah. Has the cure progressed? Are you aware of it? You've been back in the service and yeah. you found help from it? So um, the the kind of second me in time then that I went down when I was about, about three years ago, which was really good. Um, that time I did get a lot of help. I think there was a kind of a couple of factors. Like the first, the first one was that the therapist that I had there in the eating disorder services, I had actually been with her before um, when I had had a period of, um, it was called interpersonal therapy and we'd been working. This was straight out of the hospital. I'd started working with her on that. And we'd been for like a year working, so we knew each other really well. And she knew that I had been struggling with the eating disorder for so long. I think the fact that she now worked with it within the eating disorder services kind of helped my case that I got help. And she was brilliant. Um, and for almost a year then, we were working together. Um, I think everybody would kind of say that, that the services aren't sufficient at the minute. There isn't enough help for people. Which is why I was very aware of that at the stage. At whenever I came out of the hospital, um, that's why I started looking for help elsewhere, and that's where I came across, you know, the Eating Disorders Association, the charity, and I was able to start getting a bit of help from them and a lot of help from them, and I was even able to start going to their support groups every week. Um, they also introduced me to another charity, Links Counselling, that again had you know specifically eating disorders therapists and courses even that I could go on so um by the time I came back into the service the the services again I had started to understand a wee bit more about it as well so I, I think also to be fair that second time that I had went in um I was at a stage where um my weight had dropped significantly I had lost a large amount of weight in a very short time and everything that always came whenever I went through one of those peri those times you know the hair loss and maybe the period stopping and the kind of physical symptoms had all kicked in and your, I think and I'm sorry to, to your body started shutting like you you weren't you weren't in the period you're, you're losing your hair your body just stops starts sh shutting down and, and yeah I mean um I kind of would have went through that cycle kind of throughout the 10 years of, of my eating disorder. So at times it would have presented like, you know, the, the kind of typical bulimia, you know, but but maybe my weight wouldn't have fluctuated much. And then there were times that in a kind of restrictive period of that bulimia, um, I wouldn't be eating for a lot of months um, and I would be over exercising and I would lose a lot of weight. This was just kind of constant for me, you know, losing a large amount of weight and then putting it back on you know this was just kind of the cycle that my eating disorder took so that second time that I presented to the services it was in one of those stages where my weight had dropped significantly and yes every time I did that my my body would just start you know it wasn't getting any food it wasn't getting what it needed so it would kind of the way that I understand it anyway in my head is that it had to take anything it was getting, had to go on the kind of the essentials, you know, keeping your, your heart going, keeping your, your body going. So anything that it didn't see it needed to, it would kind of shut off. So periods and my my hair would start to come out and I couldn't go to the bathroom. And, you know, yeah, I think that that was kind of typical. But, um, you know, for, for me, I... 
I I only have the diagnosis, and not only, but you know, I, my diagnosis is is a bulimia. So I can see now that at those times that that was happening, it was um, like a real just restrictive period of that bulimia that had gone on for for months, and that's that's why that was happening. Now, as soon as I started to eat again, or um, kind of started coming out of that that part of the cycle, all of that would would within a couple of months would would kind of click back into place. You know what I mean? It sounds so extreme. Sorry, Sean. No, no, it's okay. Um, do you mind me asking just how, wh- what was the lead up until you were, you know, as in when you were admitted to the hospital? Like, was that stuff when you says, look, you need to go and get that help, you need to go into the hospital or how did that come about, you know, the lead up to that? Because obviously this book comes from the events and everything that went on in the hospital. So I don't want to skip past that bit without, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But if, are you happy enough to, yeah, to talk about that? Yeah, and um, so I was admitted into the hospital, nothing to do. I know we've talked a lot here about eating disorders, mm-hmm. which, you know, is, is, is great, you know, but um, the reason that I was admitted into the hospital was the depression that I had. The, the eating disorder wasn't really looked at, you know, as a factor in any of that, mm-hmm. or it was never really mentioned whenever I was in the hospital. Um, it was just something that was all also going on at the same time. Um, so I, I had been struggling obviously with depression for a long time but I was still working I was working as a primary school teacher and but just kind of progressively getting worse and finding it harder and harder to get through the days and to kind of keep up that mask that I was okay and that things were okay and that I was coping um and that kind of escalated to a point where um I was in kind of ended up in like an A&E one night like a mental health A&E and that um led to me getting like a community nurse kind of that I would see a couple of times a week that escalated further I had a home care team so it would have been nurses that would have came to the house every day um and it was at one of those visits that I kind of admitted I suppose or I kind of came out I said that I it became clear that I wasn't safe anymore and that I couldn't keep myself safe. Um, I had a plan of, of what I wanted to do to, to, to hurt myself and it had been such a long, long period of, of being unwell at that stage. I just, I couldn't think of any other way to to get through this. I couldn't, I just couldn't keep existing with, with what was happening at that stage. It was so painful, it was so awful um, and one day that after a couple of weeks of those that home care team and the nurses in and out of the house um, they had said we can't leave here because you're not safe you know I, at that stage I knew what I was going to do I knew when I knew how and, and I was I was kind of I'd kind of made my peace with it I think a wee bit which is why maybe I admitted it that day because to me it didn't seem like a big deal anymore I kind of made the decision Um, obviously you know and thankfully now looking back they had said well we can't leave you you're not safe we can't walk out of this house so the nurse made a call um and I think within about half an hour um my name was on a bed then in, in a hospital in Belfast um it was in an over 65 ward it's the only bed that was available but um she then the nurse came back in and said look I want you to go into the hospital if you say no, I want you're gonna have to go anywhere. I want you to go anyway. But I sort of said, yeah, I was kind of past it at that stage. My he- head wasn't really in the moment. I didn't really know what was happening. I said, okay, yeah, whatever. And um, my mum then packed packed me a wee bag and we went over into the hospital. Do you think at that point, like you knew yourself, you just wanted help, and that because I'm listening out there, like you had the plan, and everything else, but I think. At that point, I would be just like, I just want somebody to help me through this. I definitely n- wanted something. I needed something. I could not continue what, with what was happening, which is why those kind of those suicidal thoughts had become so almost sensible, you know, because 
I couldn't, I couldn't do that anymore. I could not keep living that way. It was so horrendous. It was so awful. It was just 24 hours a day. It's even dreaming, you know, what my dreams were horrendous. I just couldn't get away from, from the thoughts at that stage. And yeah, I definitely needed something. But at that time, um, I hadn't thought of, of a hospital as, as I hadn't really thought that there was anything. I didn't really think of there's an alternative to this. I think I'd sort of given up that there was any help or I'd given up that there was any support. I didn't think that there was another way to live. So when when the nurse said, okay, you have to go into the hospital, um, I kind of thought, okay, this is just another part of this journey that we're on. But I didn't think that it would be something that would help me even. I just sort of thought, okay, someone's telling me to go here, I will. And I'd nearly kind of given up at that stage. I was doing whatever anybody told me to do, you know. Yeah. You, you sound exhausted there at that point. You've just been so long feeling that way. And this is one thing, and I know it was hard for you to, to, to discuss having suicidal thoughts or thoughts of taking your life. Man, because it's, it's the loved ones now listening and, 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 and you know, like, but that is the point and where you're completely exhausted and you're ready to give up and your mind snapped and you see no other option. But... We don't often give credit to the community mental health teams that they're so underfunded, so overloaded, but the fact that they made that intervention and and, and knew that and, and got you there and got you help. Yeah. Like, you know, people see, and, and like even, you know, when I read that, people see and they hear psychiatric and, and, and they just automatically just be like, oh shit, no, no, no. But sometimes they'll turn off, you know, you're you're living in your own hell there. When you went in to the ward and you got your initial consultation and obviously medication, was was that was that the the bottom where where you were like because we have spoke to so many people and they're like that there's the point where you come and you're like I have to do something now, I, if I am to to survive here or if I am to do something I have to do something now. Was it then then? that point came for you or or was it more of a process or no at, at, when I first went into the hospital I was just kind of going through the motions for me I was still very set on the plan that I had and for me kind of the hospital was just sort of like a waiting game you know until until that that would happen um no I think my head was just in such a state at that point I didn't even have the thoughts of okay this is where I'm gonna get better or this is how this is I'm gonna start to recover you know I was just probably in shock a wee bit as well you know the things had escalated and got to that point um to be fair I by the time I was kind of coming out of the hospital I had started to get a wee bit of the motivation that like a lot of the people I was meeting in there and pa patients that I was starting to become friendly with over the weeks, you know, had been telling me that that was maybe their second, third, fourth time, you know, in and out of, of one of those places. And I could see from my experience that there wasn't anything there for me. There wasn't any support, you know, there wasn't anything that would help me in there. So by the time I was coming out of the hospital, I, I sort of went... I don't want to have to go back in there. And that's not, some people do need that. And we're so lucky that we do have that kind of service to keep people safe, you know, when they need it. And it's, it's not, it's nothing on anyone. If they do have to go in and out, that's what they need at that time. But I just sort of saw this isn't going to help me. So I have to try and find help somewhere else. But there were kind of these moments then, like throughout the hospital, kind of these wee, moments where I started to think maybe there'll be something in the future maybe there'll be a day where I don't feel like this um and I kind of had to keep clinging on to those and I did eventually start to get a wee tiny bit of that hope back that maybe maybe it won't always be like this I don't think if anybody had told me that I would recover I would have necessarily believed you at that point that took like a long time to start getting that back but yeah it was probably the start of I can only 
can only go up from here. You know, I couldn't, I don't think I could have got more unwell at that stage. Then you were linked, were you linked back in with the eating disorder then when you came out or were you still with the community mental health when you had come out of the hospital or were you working with both or? Um, no, when I came out of the hospital, yes, I had home care team for a couple of weeks. Um, and then there was referrals made for uh, therapy, like an interpersonal therapy. Um, I had a psychiatrist that I would have seen every so often talk about the medication I was on. Um, but initially when I came out of the hospital, I would have got the most help from charities and from organisations. You know, I got a lot of help from AWARE NI and the Eating Disorders Association from Lighthouse Charity. Um, you know, I, it was those kind of organisations that for me kind of stepped up at that time and took me in whenever I was so unwell and they kind of bridged that gap of being discharged um, and then, you know, months later or whatever it was, getting getting those referrals and getting some kind of long-term therapy. If you hadn't reached out to the charities, and I know the, the mental health in, in this country is so underfunded and so understretched, but if you hadn't reached out, there's a, there is quite a significant period between seeing somebody you, to go into therapy from from hospital to therapy when you would think in your mind that somebody's most vulnerable and, and they're in a bad place and, and we would need to get acting quick here. But without them, you wouldn't have had an immediate help or, or, or care? I mean, I had a home care team for a couple of weeks, maybe two or three weeks. So that was somebody either calling you or coming to the house. To be honest with you, it was mostly, are you safe? Are you suicidal? Like, or should we be concerned about your safety? And that's not... um those anything on those people it was kind of that's the kind of only resource that they had they had to just look at the bare minimum are you are you safe today um now i think from coming out of the hospital i kind of got bumped up the queue on those other referrals back into the eating disorders um services um getting the interpersonal therapy that i had you know for for like a year so i think i moved up the queue a wee bit but Yes, I mean, in terms of of support beyond like a a check in for like safety wise, um, I I there's no way I, I would have been able to start making any progress without the the charities and the organisations that, that that stepped in. The 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 where the see and you go to approach some of these with an eating disorder, and. The cycle that you were in when you would get to your lowest and you'd lose weight and, and you would have the, the hair starting to fall out and stuff like that, you would look ill. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the thing. Not always. The, whenever at those times, um, you know, at that sort of stage is not kind of part of the cycle when I wasn't eating, um, you know, and losing the weight. Um, people would have come up to me and said, oh, my God, you look amazing. What are you doing? Tell me your secret. Whatever diet you're doing, it's working wonders for you. Shit. They're just, they're feeding that fire at, at that not point. Not intentionally No, no, at I, all. I, I know, but, yeah, I, but, but if somebody's reaffirming what you're doing is right. From the outside, it, pr um, it probably, and like we had mentioned earlier, like talking about BMI charts a wee bit, and that's a whole other thing. But like I had said to you, the only time that I've ever really been in that like normal section was whenever my body was massively struggling under so much pressure. You know, when I was having to go for regular blood tests and um, heart scans and stuff because of the pressure I was putting myself under. So maybe from the outside, I'd say a lot of people would have just thought, oh, she's maybe lost a lot of weight, but wouldn't have been concerned. Whereas inside my body was just starting to shut down. For my body, it was massively underweight and it was having serious like physical kind of consequences because of that and that's why now I never comment on anybody's weight if they've put on weight if they've lost weight I'll just say how are you how are you doing how are you feeling because you know people have no idea there could whatever there could be a reason for someone 
losing weight or putting on weight or whatever. It's it's nobody else's business, you know, unless you're kind of trying to look out for somebody. But you just never, you never know. Oh, well, that BMI that you're saying is such a bad scale to rate things on. Yeah. I got my BMI done this morning and we spoke about it already. One of the talk my height and weight, I'm overweight. I don't know. It's, it's just such it's a it's such a, a, a bad way to I may not get on that chart. I'll just leave that out. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're we we are and we're joking here, and you, you've given me so much to think about because I may have said to somebody, Geez, you look great. And and to think that I may be feeding into something that's that's consuming them just makes me think for that wee minute, you know what I want? Maybe say how are you keeping or Oh, you're looking happy, or 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 maybe not say anything and and pass for because you don't know. We always say this: we don't know the fight that people are having. But you know, one thing that I'm wondering: when you're like that and you can see the physical, you can see the physical uh, effects of of uh, your eating disorder. Are you when you go into the eating disorder clinic? Are they like, oh yeah, you need help, or you still need help, no matter the appearance. Yeah. Of it, and maybe you needed to help a bit quicker to stop to be there. But is it a case because we're so stressed and and we're so underfunded that you said you got bumped up as in your your mental health in a bad state? We need to help you now. But when in previous times a DVD did, you know, it, and I, I'm I'm sorry if I'm being harsh on on the service, but it, I did get that opinion that it was like, oh, now you're showing the physical effects of an eating disorder. It's more important when at any point in that cycle, it's important to break the cycle. Obviously, yeah. obviously, you're becoming it to the point where it's, it's life threatening on your mm-hmm. on your body. So they, they want to step in. But what I mean is the help within the mental health and it's such a complex because you would say that depression and eating disorder. You nearly can't have one without the other. You're not happy. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're not happy and your thoughts aren't rational and you're not seeing yourself as 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 you should and you would it's it's as sean said it's a complex issue there's lots of of things and it's almost like a a vicious circle where do we treat the depression to help with the eating disorder do we treat the eating disorder to help with the depression it's it's and and how bad do you have to be in your eating disorder for somebody to say you need help yeah and like at the point we were talking about anorexia, anorexia, you can you can see and and when people are bulimic and 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 being really sore on themselves, they may not present themselves like somebody that's any ailments, but they haven't had calories or they haven't consumed calories and and their body's starting to shut down. So it's just to me, it's such a complex and it's like, is that the case when you presented yourself that when you were you're ill, then it was okay, we'll help you now or not, we'll help you now, but. It's more important to help you now. Is that a is that a is that a fair enough assessment? I yeah, I mean I I definitely feel like for me it was a bit of a missed opportunity that first time I presented. We could have nearly kind of nipped it in the bud, you know. I feel like the longer that your eating disorder is within you and it's ingrained or the longer that it's allowed to continue or it, it's continuing, the harder it is to fight back at it, you know, and to start tackling it. So for me, I did feel like whenever I had first presented all of those years before, I was just as ill as the time, the next time I came. But say on a BMI chart, I wasn't presenting as, as, un, as underweight. But um, at the same time, the services that are there and we're, we're lucky to have them, they can only do what they can do. And they obviously have to prioritise who who needs the help most you know at that time um but I think that's where places like the eating disorders association are so amazing because they will take anybody you know they will help anybody that's saying I am struggling with food or I am struggling with my body it doesn't matter you know what you look like or maybe what what a scale says that that your weight is if you are struggling they will help you you know and, and they they kind of come at it from from that angle, you know. Maybe they better understand. I, I don't know. It's hard because 
I don't I don't understand the I don't know the the restrictions that the eating disorder services he, are here you know and and there's fantastic services as well at getting people that, that really need help but just from speaking to people you know there's there's a lot of people that can't get the help either that they need you know that are really struggling um and that's why you just we're lucky to have places that are willing to step in to, to help people when when maybe the, the services can't. The, you you you'd said obviously about you spoke to your mum about it, but uh, knowing what you know now, is there any advice that you'd say that you could give to a parent who's maybe in the same situation as that? Like how could a parent help their children or somebody that they know? Like, is there any advice that you could give them? Because I wouldn't know what to do or what to say. I know it's so hard um well one of the first things is just to try and find out as much as possible do you know um by contacting you know one of the charities or the organizations and find out uh, understand because for me I didn't under I still don't really understand a lot to do about eating disorders it's you know it's it's complex but get as much information as you can access as much help as you possibly can so reach out to to all of these places and like there was a lot of charities that even my mum was able to get help from as well you know um like cause the charity for for carers here in northern ireland and she was able to get help from from the Eat disorders association and um but really the one of the things is just trying to keep those kind of lines of communication open between yourself and your loved one you know and, and say to them i'm i'm not going to be able to help you know cure you or fix this or take all of this away but just tell me what you're thinking tell me what you're feeling and make like a safe space for them to come and open up to you and let them know that no matter what you say to them they're not going to judge you they're not going to try and tell you what to do they're not going to say what you're thinking is ridiculous or is wrong or is stupid you know they're that you're just there for them one place that they can go and try to offload because it's so hard and it's so heavy having to carry all that yourself and feeling like there's no outlet for you and feeling like there's nowhere you can go and be safe to, to speak about it um and just keep fighting for the help that you know that your loved one needs and that the help that they deserve sometimes you do you have to be your your own biggest advocate you know um everybody deserves help and recovery and full recovery from an eating disorder is absolutely possible but it's just finding that help and and reaching out for it yeah it's hard it sounds so hard for all the people yeah yeah and sometimes when when you're going through something you you see your tunnel and the not not the, the effects and obviously your mother was with you and, and, and you know watching your daughter and struggling uh, like it would be absolutely heartbreaking I, I hear what you were saying there and I was like I'm not sure I could do like I would be, it was so what you said and you're right you, you need to be there and not judging and not, not I would be so I'm not my I know my wife would be that person and, and, and could I would just it would be so hard for me but we're, we're the one thing and we've we've touched on it and how hard it was and, and what about relationships because I know we, when we're talking we're joking out there and we're, we're thinking you're, you're heading away with your partner and but what the fact did you you wouldn't have been for relationships and, and people around and close you know what, what effect did that have with you yeah the for me the eating disorder dictated who I could speak to and what I could say and how much I could be honest and how much I could open up and the eating disorder told me the types of things that I could go to and the types of things that I could be involved in like it it controlled what and when and where I went um it, so it, some, it felt like kind of this other person in your relationship your relationship with your partner or with your friends or your family it was like me and then there was the eating disorder all was there kind of whispering in, in my ear and telling me what I should be saying and thinking and believing. Um, so, yeah, it was it was so difficult and so hard, like for my mum, you know, with, at the time watching all of that. And 
for the most part, pretty kind of powerless. You know, no one person can fix somebody or can can take away an eating disorder. You know, from them. Um, yeah, it, it still is hard, but thankfully now, kind of the the people that I do have around me and and my boyfriend, you know, I've had to have sit down and have really clear conversations with them and say, look, there's times that I will sit with you and say. I am really struggling with this. I need you to help me. I want some like advice or like, what would you do in this situation? What would you say to me? There's other times I know what I'm thinking or I know what I'm doing to myself. It's not good and it's not rational. I just need you to listen and nod and let me know that you hear me and that you understand. I don't want you to come back and, and tell me, tell me what to do. I kind of know deep down probably what I should be doing, but I need somebody to kind of talk to you about it. Um, and, you know, thankfully, I have a couple of people that I can always, always do that with. Um, but, you know, I say to them as well, like, it's not for you to, I think your loved ones, you want to fix whoever's in front of you. And I kind of have to say to them, you're not going to be able to take this away. Like nothing you say to me will just kind of wave a magic wand and it's gone. But it's enough just knowing that I can talk to you and that you can be there. But it's even though I'm in recovery with eating disorder, like there's good days and there's bad days. You know, there's maybe days could go by and, and I'm I'm doing really, really well with it and getting making proper progress and then something happens and it's like we take five steps back, but it's just being honest about that, you know, and like my boyfriend, like he's brilliant, you know, he's the patience of an absolute saint and we'll sit and talk through all that and I can kinda of go, right, like why did that happen? Why have I had that? We relapse or we slip up and you know I suppose I'm lucky just in having some somebody to do that with but it's trial and error you know we kind of you kind of work out what works for us yeah there is times in our life when I remember one day and you just said that my wife was like I don't want advice I don't want a thing I don't want you to say anything I'm ready to vent yeah. And just and and Let's there's times it. that we all need that there on and it's great and and you know when we come in and you know we don't know people's battles you come in there and we, we people don't obviously know but before we come in we have a bit of a chat and get a background before so we don't sound complete idiots all the time which we do anyway but the, we were having a laugh and we're having a joke and everything you know and you don't understand sometimes the the but obviously you've you've come through it and you're working with it and you've identified it i think sometimes do you think when you understand yourself and 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 the, the help sometimes in therapy getting to understand yourself the triggers that trigger you the root the the pattern of your thought when you can see them traits it's almost like somebody's taking you outside of something and you're like i can i, I can actually see where i'm starting to go here and you have them good people around you now you feel not stronger to cope with, not not I'm saying bulbred, but stronger to cope with because you're like, right, I'm 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 starting to go and I want to stop here because I don't want to go all the way down that road. But you start to identify some behaviour patterns and you're like, right, I, I want to talk to you and I want to say this and, 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 and it helps and it Yeah. Yeah, all the stuff that I didn't I didn't do for, you know, ten years is what I should have been or, you know, not that I should have been doing, you know, because it took a long time to work that out and to learn what works for me. But yeah, um, I think even from kind of going through all of that, uh, I have a lot more understanding, you know, that you don't know what anybody else is ever is ever going through, you know. And I don't think I've met anybody who's not got something going on, you know, at, at home or in their head, you know. Um, no, no, you're Sorry. right. Sorry. Because I, I, I was Sorry. putting you on the spot. But, but you know, no. it's, it's even it's even just, look, it's something that you know that you're going to have to live with. Mm -hmm. But it's not letting it define you. You're a smart, intelligent woman, an author. You've read a book. There's not too many people you can say has read, read, it, read, read their own yeah. book. Owen's thinking of writing one. <laughs> Memoirs. You have enough <laughs> stories in you. Aye, aye. Most of them bullshit. Memoirs are the bullshit. <laughs> but, you know, for a play to you, Unwinding a 10 year clock is not an easy pattern and the, the, them things and I know you don't want to use the, the term and we said in green slipping but it's not in green we're going we unwind what but when you condition yourself for 10 years it's a very very hard thing 
to change your reality because that's what you're effectively doing changing the mm-hmm. reality that you you what you told yourself was true for 10 years yeah. you're now identifying wasn't it's not an easy an easy job but it, it, I, i'm so glad that we're here at this and we're talking to you now and and that you're now openly honest saying i've had my moments i'm i'm not jumping around here saying i'm cured i'm i'm not jumping around saying this is what everyone else should do i'm just saying this is my story but the fact we're here now you've wrote a book you've went through oh my god like it sounded so horrible horrifying that you know the prison that you kept yourself in not that you kept yourself in but your your mind but it's so good to be here now and you have a book now that's feeding in back to charities you're here and i have no doubt i had absolutely zero understanding of it and some of the things you've you've said really have made me think. And my worry is that I go away from here and this is human nature. You think for two days and then you slip back to just saying the same old, same old. And like I, I see things I do and I'm like, damn, they, they, that that's not something I should do, you know. But but it's flipping comments, even yeah. when we're talking there and through the whole thing. I was like, I have a wee girl and I was like, oh, a wee skinny money. But she's not. She's fit and healthy. But it's just, oh, you know, it's just a flipping comment that and I'm like, like, you, you know, know, I'm obviously looking at all that through the lens yeah, of yeah. an eating disorder. Do you know what I mean? But Thankfully, so many people won't experience any of that. So yeah. I'm obviously so sensitive now to comments and, and, you know, even like in the gym. I was in the gym yesterday at a class, dance class. And at the end of it, like the girl was saying all about, right, we've burnt however many calories you've now all deserved to go and eat your dinner. Do you know? Mm-hmm. The, but I'm just sensitive to that kind of thing. Yeah, you don't yeah. need to be walking around going... I can't say anything. Yeah. You know, a lot of people will... will Shit, when she sees this podcast, she's going to feel bad. <laughs> 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 but, but you're right. And this is a, a very valuable lesson on anything. You don't know anything anyone's going through. Be careful of what you say because you don't know what part you may play in their thing to try and be nice and keep your opinions and, and this is me now i'm saying this this is glass houses throwing stones <laughs> i ain't gonna have to watch what i say but i i i, I, I i'm so glad you come on neve because it sounded absolutely horrific and what you've went through your poor family and and, and to see you sitting here now with a book feeding back into the charities and like even when I'm saying things like this, I'm like, oh my god, I shouldn't say. Oh uh, no! No, no, no! But that's what I mean. I am so like worried. You're but, so scared of it now. We're this, all just doing our and best. I, but I think this is the, the point. Where I say shit all the time, put my foot in it. But I, I don't think we should worry about that. But I think we should worry about sometimes the, the passive comments we make at people, and that you know that is the biggest thing we joked about the uh, politicians not being back at work, but. The mental health in Northern Ireland needs a massive injection or it needs some point of direction because it's just failing. And mm-hmm. it is failing. It's a failing system. We know the NHS is a failing system. But to have you back here, the book, Money Going to the Charity, I think But we good. keep on talking of the book. We actually haven't spoke about what is in the book. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, we've covered it's a lot. Right. We've covered a lot. Yeah. yeah. But, and you did say the two charities, so I'm just going to actually get a wee nosy. Yeah. We're going to give us the wee So the book is about project. your journey while you were in hospital. Yeah, because I know we spoke all about eating disorders. Yeah. There's not a massive... Well, no, there is. I mean, I, I would do talk about the eating disorder in it, mm-hmm. but... Um, well, who, the book itself, Neve, is this for people to understand... So, And I know this sounds stupid. Is this for people to understand what it's like? Is this for a family member? If you are a father or a mother or a sister or a partner of somebody that's going through this, would this uh, reading this give you an insight into the mindset? Or is this for somebody that is struggling with with uh, eating disorder or is this for both is this a, a rounded view if you were to read this it gives a better understanding of 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 the mindset uh, yeah i think it's both so um obviously it's my experience you know it's how i experienced depression and, and how I, I experienced being you know an inpatient then in, in the couple of psychiatric hospitals so i think I hope anyway, and what people have told me is that it does give an insight into what depression can look like. Obviously, it's different for everybody, what inpatient stay can look like. But a lot of, um, you know, carers of people looking after, like a loved one with depression or with an eating disorder, have said that it's helped give them an insight into what 
their loved one could be going through because if you haven't experienced that yourself it's so difficult to understand what could be going through their head and and I can say that there definitely be like a frustration at times you know my mum probably felt going why can why are you not better or why are you not get, getting better you know why is this still such a such a struggle and it's kind of understanding that it's it's a very serious mental illness you know and if I could have helped it at that stage I would have done everything I could but I just I couldn't I needed a lot more kind of serious interventions um so yeah I think it's for anybody that struggled themselves might find a wee bit of comfort in in reading about somebody else's story and saying that you're not the only one that's maybe going through something um but at the same time like there's health warnings on the book to say if you are at a period in your life where you are maybe really struggling with depression or an eating disorder just to be mindful that maybe it's not the best time for you to read read my story right now because there are parts of the book that are upsetting you know it was written day you know minute by minute and there are times that I get upset still reading back on it and um, I'm also trying to get the book in the hands of as many people working in mental health you know doctors and nurses and the social workers and the OTs and everybody that you come into contact with when when you're you're kind of going through the system um just to kind of understand what that can be like from the patient's perspective and how sensitive you know and vulnerable you maybe feel at that stage and how important language that's being used around you and how people interact with you and kind of these professionals that I know I kind of had up on this pedestal just sort of how they they interact with their patients and a reminder of of how scary and unknown that whole experience can be for somebody um so yeah hopefully there's there's a few kind of different groups that could maybe get something out of it um that's was the only motivation for ever doing it was just where can we get it um you can get it really anywhere you can get your books like the publisher beyond the pale you can get it on their website but you can get it in waterstones and you can get it on amazon and you can get it in kind of wee independent bookshop so well look you've heard it you've heard it here first go out <laughs> and get it Neve, thank you so so much but let's we're finishing up 30 this year yeah. planning a big trip some very dubious choices <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's good things on the horizon we said it. You're heading away. I There's am good things. What away. what are our plans have we got on the horizons? Um well, yeah, I'm heading away next week for the big thirtieth. Um, kind of been saving the pennies all year for like a big trip. So well, that'll be good. I can't wait for that. Um but no, it's still busy, like with the book and stuff at the minute, and I'm still kind of enjoying it. So as long as I'm enjoying it, like we'll keep going and um yeah. Life, life's good at the minute Brilliant. well look it's, it's been a pleasure having you on and thank you very much Neve. Neve, thank you thanks thank you